never know. I just try to do the best I can. The time of day is squirrel! We're going to talk about distraction. Now, I get on the turn here, but I'm just going to, come, I'm going to start right here in the book of Nehemiah. Mm. Nehemiah, the, the wall had been broken down in Jerusalem and been besieged for 400 years plus. And, God, and Nehemiah had this comfy government job, and so God spoke to him and said, I want you to go and rebuild it all. Why? No, he didn't. Oh. Okay. True question. Uh. He, had this com he had this job. And he was, I mean, literally, he had a government job. He was, he was the cup king, cup bearer for the king. And some Jews came and told them about the destruction. God didn't say a word, but he took it on himself. Okay. He, 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 he risked his own life to, to tell the king, I need to go. Because they, they behead you for nothing back then. So he goes into town, he gets in at night, he rides in there, and, and when he tells the king, the king gives him his credit card, basically, go to my forest, get out all the wood you need, yeah. Yeah, here's a letter of passage to get you right there. When he gets there, he finds all these people who are destructive, just absolutely, just mesmer, just decimated, yes. destroyed, have no vim and vigor, but he begins to share what God, what God was doing in his life. And as he began to share that, they became energized. And guess what? They all took up their place, they took up their tool, and went to rebuild this wall. And it wasn't a bunch of professional wall builders. It's just a bunch of people. Some of them were silversmiths. Some of them were, you know, I don't know, Pottery. scrapbookers. But they, <laughs> they went and built this wall. And sure enough, the first thing that the enemy tried is he tried to ridicule them. Make fun of it. How many of you have ever tried to do anything that nobody's ever done? And the first thing that people do is that's why you don't share your vision with just everybody. You don't tell everybody what's going on. You don't spread pearls before swine. But when that didn't work, they started threatening them. So we're going we're gonna to come up behind you when you're not even looking. We're going to kill you. Guess what? They had a little moment there, but they decided we're going to pick up our weapon and work with one hand and hold our weapon with the other. And they kept building. I mean, let me tell you something right now. If you want to shut up the naysayers about what you're doing, the ones that want to talk at you and make mouths at you, let them turn around and hit blood in their nose on your wall. Yeah. Because you know what? The thing they said couldn't happen is standing there halfway up. So now that's working, right? Yeah. So then they send this letter to Nehemiah. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall. And they said to me, saying, come, let us meet together. <laughs> Among the villages in the plain of Ono, but they meant to do me harm. The word plain of Ono means come to where we're strong. Yeah. Come play to our strength. Yeah. And you know what I said? Why well, I got to talk to you? Why do I got to come up this wall to talk with you? Even though they were buttering his bread. And I'm going to tell you something. There are times in your life when the people that used to curse you and, and, and attack you, when they start praising you, oh, it's a real intoxicating feeling to go let them just you know, get a little back. But the whole purpose of that is to get you off the wall. Okay. Touch your neighbor and say, get back on that wall. <laughs> Next question. What is distraction? Distraction is a diversionary tactic. Slide of hand. You know how magicians work? They get you looking at this hand while they're doing some of them. They keep you tied up in the same spot, no longer moving forward, just paralyzed by life. That is the thing. You know, that, that, you know why lion trainers carry a stool? I would think an AK-47 would be more <laughs> appropriate. But they'll get in there with a whip and a stool. You know why? Because that lion will try to fixate on all four legs of that stool. And it keeps him to where he can't focus on anything. And he can't, can't do what he came to do. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. It's kind of like the old story about the leprechaun. Now, I don't believe in this at all. So don't write me a letter or email or nothing like that. But it said that this guy caught the leprechaun. And you know, if he catches the leprechaun, he's got to take it to his pot of gold. So he caught the leprechaun and he said, listen, where's your pot of gold? He took him to this tree. In the forest, middle of the forest, and said, "Okay, you cannot move this gold. You cannot do anything to to hide it from me, cover it back up." And so the man was afraid that somebody else would get it, so he buried it, and he put a ribbon on that tree. He went to get his wheelbarrow, and when he came back, 
There was a ribbon on every tree. Oh my God. Yeah. The devil can't defeat you. He can't come at you direct on and defeat you. Have enough strength and power and authority to beat you. But what he can do is keep you so distracted, yeah. so deluded, yeah. that you haven't got your single focus, your single purpose. And that's why he's draining you dry with life. Thank you. First Timothy 1, 18 and 19, he said this, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith of suffered simply. You know how you fall? You know how you mess up? It's not, you know that, that I don't see in here that it was some sort of uh, uh, demonic attack or some sort of, you know, even in a, some sort of bad habit or whatever. No, how it works is that he attacks your faith by he starts giving you more than one scenario. So what's the first words out of the devil's mouth? Did God really say? That's a distraction. Because before that, there were no alternatives. God said it. But now something's been introduced that is fighting that. And a good conscience, that's just when you know what you're doing. I, I talked to somebody the other day and said the greatest proof of the existence of God is our conscience. Yeah. Who says something's right or wrong? I've talked to people before they were ever born again. They, my, my daughter, when she hit that hot dog, it broke my heart. I tell you a story. Oh, my pristine little Taylor Kane, little, little Cindy Lou Who off of the Grinch cartoon. <laughs> Big blue eyes and and, uh, of course, we got her addicted to sugar early, so <laughs> that's for us. But, so the rule was you had to eat your real food before you could get some ice cream or anything like that. So we cooked her a hot dog, and she's sitting at the table with big blue eyes. And I turned around, and I came back to the table, and that hot dog is gone. Oh, wow, she was hungry. I said, Dad, did you eat all that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I gave her some ice cream, and later on, I was cleaning up the kitchen, <laughs> and I swept up this hot dog behind the room. How did my little baby girl know, A, that, that that was wrong enough to lie about it? Because she had a conscience. There's something born in every person on this earth. There's a God awareness. There's a right and a wrong. And you know it, even somebody can tell you. But how is that there? Because somebody has to establish what's right and wrong. There has to be a beginning of that. That's the existence of God. Next question. Here's a fact. The longer you toil in a distraction, poor, please hear me, the more carnal you become. The more carnal you become, the more damage you are doing to your conscience and your faith. The longer you are caught between two opinions. That's what Elijah said. You know, how long are y'all going to falter between two opinions? Either serve God or serve the devil. Make up your mind. And I'm just saying right now, how much more of sin do we have to have before we finally figure it out it's not giving us anything on the side? It's not even what it claims to be. Cost too much, stays too long. None of it's worth that. Next page. You still with me? Yeah. Acts 27 14. I want to tell you this story. I've told it a lot of times, but I'll draw back there again. Paul was put on a prison ship. And they're sailing to Crete. There's pros and cons to Crete. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Pastor Cameron. I'm always going to courtesy laugh out of you. Well, they're in the, he's in the ship and he's a prisoner. He's in chains. They put him in the middle of the ship and right before they get on. You know, Paul. I don't think we should sail. Really? Prisoner? I'm so glad you, you know, did you graduate Harvard with a meteorology degree or what? I'm just so glad. So they stuffed him in a hole, and sure enough, they sailed. And guess what? There came a storm instead of tempestuous wind blew that had a name. Nor'easter. The only things we name, I reckon, are hurricanes, right? So a hurricane came and hit that ship. And there was a time that, in the middle of that time, now let's take care. You already have a little idea. She's not bothering me. She's not bothering me. Come on back. <laughs> Is she bothering you? No. Come on. We all did that once, right? Yeah. Yes. I want anybody to hear it. Okay? They were in the middle of this hurricane trying to sail this way, and the wind was blowing right in their face. And it said this, when we were caught and could not head in the direction we wanted to, we just let it go. What does that mean? We just let the ship be blown by the wind. Next page, I'm going to tell you something. 
The first step out of distractions is there will be times when mounting a frontal assault against the enemy will be so expensive that the loss is not worth the victory. You'll be caught in a moment where you're caught off guard and you can stand there and get pummeled. And you can say, you know what, Lord, I can't. I, I, it's, it's getting the best of me. I'm going to let it drive me until I catch my breath and yeah. catch my way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to say, let her drive, right? Let her drive. Let her drive. Let's say it again like with me. Let her drive. Let her drive. You know, this is one of the things I was talking to as a child. People, people told me that God had a plan. God, God had control over my life. And I'm thinking some of that I get that I have a component in it that I'm responsible for. But how many of you know sometimes it's just to say, God, I don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah. Amen. Catch me. Yeah. Help me stand up again. But that, that is at your disposal. Okay, next page. Acts chapter 27, it said the next thing they did is when they, when they could not fight the wind, they started lightening the ship. Stuff that, now listen to me, stuff that was important in the beginning. Yeah. Yes. Suddenly not very important now. I'm going to tell you right now, when the Titanic went down in eight, uh, 1815, I think, right? 1812? 1915. No, that's what I meant. 1915. <laughs> I was 100 years old. Yeah. <laughs> there was a report that they were lowering these, these life rafts down, these lifeboats, and it said that already they had had as many as they, needed. as they needed. And there was a woman on one of them being lowered down. She said, stop. Jump off the boat, back on to the deck, ran to Jack. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she ran back into, inside the boat, ran right past neat coats that were all over the chairs, right past the casino uh, where all this money laid right out on the table, yeah. ran to her stateroom, passed up all those things, and grabbed three oranges off of her nightstand and ran back to the boat. Because in that moment, all those things that had so much value right. didn't matter at all. They're going to be at the bottom of the right. track yeah. in two hours. Wow. But those oranges were very valuable. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, those oranges are always valuable. You just can't see it for all the distractions. Right. Okay. So on the next day they lighten the ship. Next page. Step number two. Find the one thing that matters and focus solely on that. Dead works, things done out of a sense of duty or compulsion or somebody manipulating you or coercing you are at the heart of every distraction. Yeah. It's time to send it over the side. Yeah. Yes, sir. Get it out of your life. You don't need it. You don't, you're not getting anywhere with it. It's just sucking the life out of you everywhere you go. You're trying to keep everybody happy, everybody up to speed. Take care of yourself so that God can use you to help others. That's why they tell you when you're going to save a life, you take a buoy with you, dummy, because you know what that pull of, that other person is drowning will pull you to the bottom. And that doesn't mean I don't care about the, the drowning person, but if we both drown, what good is that? Right? Next time. Acts 27 said, on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard. Watch this. With our own hands. Now, these guys are terrified. They're, they're afraid they're going to die. They're, they said that they went a span of three days where they didn't see the sun or the moon. Okay. And they had given up all hope they were going to make it. And on the third day of this journey, this is before they gave up their wheat, their food source, and through the tackling. And I thought that's, you know, when we catch it. That's not what tackling is. I looked it up. Tackling is what you use to steer the boat. Wow. And the key phrase in this is with our own hands. I want to tell you something. If you let life take a hold of you and you say, well, whatever the Lord wants, that is not what we're talking about. Okay. It's when you voluntarily say, you know what? I can keep doing this, but I choose to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to make these decisions without his okay. I'm not going to do anything until he tells me to. I'm volunteering to do this. I'm not letting my circumstances make choices for me. Amen. Next page. Step three. Now listen to me carefully. There will be times when it seems that no matter how much you pray or believe or stand or rebuke or confess that nothing seems to work. Yeah. Wow. Now how many of you have had this experience in your life, right? Yeah. 
And I saw the bad convention. I'm just trying to tell you the bridge is out. It's time to, with your own hands, throw the tackling overboard. It's time for you to say, you know what, Lord? I'm smart, but I'm not way near as smart as you are. My little three-pound brain couldn't have made this universe, but you did. You know my tomorrow's before they ever get here. So I think I'm going to let you guide me through and carry me through. I'm going to focus on you and not on this other stuff around me. These little prayers that the devil said. I'm just going to run to your presence. Next page. My mouth is really dry. And that finally, at the end of the thing, and as the sailors were seeking to escape, now Paul had just stood up in front of them. I won't tell you more about this in a minute. And said, the, An angel of the Lord stood next to me and told me that we're not going to die, and, and as long as we stay with this ship, we'll be safe. What do the soldiers do? That night, they try to escape. They start lowering the skiff, which is like a rowboat, down to the water. And Paul reminds them, says, look, I told you, if you don't stay on this boat, on this ship, you're going to die. What did they do? They cut the ropes. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't understand this principle, next page, when you find yourself overwhelmed, out of time, underpaid, the devil will be sure to provide a shortcut, a plan B. And if you keep it tied up on the back of your ship, wait for something to not go your way so you can jump off this and go wherever you want, you're never going to sail into the promise of God. When you cut everything away and say, Lord God, I, to your cross I came, I'm not going to be anywhere else but with you. I have no other plan. I have no other, you know, desire but you. I'm not going to someday stop this because it's inconvenient. Or unpopular. Right. I was on my way to church this morning. I saw all these trucks driving by going to the lake, I reckon. Yep. And I'm just thinking, Lord, what happened? You know, church is just not a vital component to the lives of people. It is. It's like those oranges, but they just don't see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what are we going to do? I think this morning is the time. Let me finish this. No plan be anything to get you to compromise your walk. Deny your core values and deviate from your assignment. So it's time this morning. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. No is a complete sentence. You don't even have to explain with a five-page top resume as to why you don't want to do it. Somebody asks you to do something, you don't have to explain why. You say, you know, I don't want to do that. Thank you. And they can refer their lip out and get all patty. You know what? That's that manipulation they ever use on you all the time. It seems to work, isn't it? Right. Well, how many, how many are ready to say there's a new sheriff in town? We're not going to let that happen no more. Yeah. I got too much to do. I can't be distracted and let you suck all my anointing out so that when I do get to my son, I'm dry as a bone. I'm going to hang on to what's precious. Yes. And I'm going to let God use me when he tells me to. Yes. Right? Yes, right? yes sir. If he tells you, to stop and give the give her some money that the guy says I don't work for food. You stop. Yes, sir. But don't let that sign manipulate you. Right. Please hear me. I'm yeah. not being hard on those guys. I'm just trying to tell you that we're it, that, that kind of stuff tugs at the heart. When I was a baby Christian, I was just all crying about it. And then my friend uh, Jeff over in Hustle, hey Jeff, <laughs> told me that he used to have a shop outside. There, there was a crane store right there off one of the parkways on the main thoroughfare, and there's a big bridge of them. And he said that because in the evening they had a glass front, it was like a mirror. So they could see out, nobody could see in. And he said, we saw in the morning some people walking up on crutches, and another guy with them standing out the panhandle by the bridge. And he said, they looked this way and that way, they handed the crutches to the other guy, and he walked over a little while. I'm like, you know what, come on. Yeah. Um, again, let me re re reiterate, if God tells you to stop, do it. Right. But if he's not telling you, don't let distraction come and rob you. Yeah, right. yeah. Because that's what the devil's all about. He, he just wants to thin you out, Barry. He wants to, to get you to where nothing you're doing is really working because you're just spinning place. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't focus on the one thing that you need to do. I mean, are you with me? Yeah. Say, yeah. say, Charlie, we know that you don't hate the homeless. You don't hate the homeless. 
Thank you. Next page. Well, here's the big question, right? Why would God allow this storm? Well, I, got, I got another question. Is he truly in charge of the weather? In fact, who did he tell her to take authority over? Come on now, that's right. Stuff, right? So, so God didn't send a storm. In fact, I heard Pat Robertson say one time, and this has just stuck with me for 30 years. He said, you know what? The earth is built in such a way that it has platelets so that the pressure will not make it just blow apart. Kind of like a kid's skull when they're born. As they're growing, it's not completely formed because it has to be able to grow and expand with that brain and everything else. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. So God made the earth to where it can kind of, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's a little bit mobile. It's a little bit not settled and bricked in. Yeah. So there are fault lines. And just because there are fault lines in the earth doesn't mean you need to build a city on it. <laughs> the earth and the thermal properties of the earth, those storms develop. But you know what? God didn't say you had to build a big house right down by the water. Right. Right. Talk to the guy who was trying to swim to shore and the great white shark got him. The guy said, you know, if he wasn't carrying his good luck ham, he might have made it. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> it's Tim Conway. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that, right? That's worse than Bob. I don't know why this is work, not working. I think he'll throw my hand away. I was a devil after you let me come in and take a bite. I mean, uh, before they left, Paul had told him not to, Paul told him not to sail. Had they not been on the water, they'd all been fine, right? Well, Paul gave the suggestion he was a prisoner, a non-person. Didn't matter to them. Had no influence. Listen to me carefully. He had no audience. But promotion comes from patiently, steadfastly being obedient. Promotion comes from being steadfast, patiently obedient. When everything in your life and everybody around you is saying, get in that little boat and get away from here. Came into what's normal, what everybody likes, what everybody's doing. Abandon what you were had a conviction for so that you can be liked and, and popular. Yeah. And the funny thing is when the, when the journey began, Paul had no importance. But when the storm showed up, yeah. suddenly Paul was promoted out of the belly of the boat and he's standing up there in the captain's show. Yeah. Why is this? Because since Paul is directing the action now, everything he tells them to do, they are now hustling to complete. Why? Because a storm is your opportunity. What the devil meant for evil, God's going to bring them out for good. And I'm telling you, if you get distracted, you won't see that. You'll be so caught up in the storm that you won't see the purpose of the storm and utilize it for God's benefit. Next page. Why do we say these things? Romans 8, 28, everybody knows it, quoted it, just yeah. on a pillow. <laughs> but we know that all things, I looked up the word in the Greek, it means all, all things. Some of those things aren't so swell. Right. Some of those things aren't fun and convenient. Right. But they're still saying that all things work together yeah. for good. To those who love God, this is the first condition. Right. The second is to those who are called according to his purpose. And I looked that up in the Greek, and it used to be like, well, I don't know if I'm called or not. Okay, let me, let me break it down for you. You've been invited right. to attend his proposal. Right. The bride of Christ should be getting herself ready for, for <laughs> looking at, he's proposing to you right now to join with you. Now, if it seems freaky to you, you need to spend a little quiet time. We've all been invited. And he's saying, if you're mine, everything's going to work together for good. Not all things are good, but they're all going to work together for good. He said, in all things, uh, give thanks, for this is the will of God. What is it that all things in the will of God know? But in all things, I give thanks. Because that one Thanksgiving do. It says around the wall, I'll enter your gates with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So as long as I can be thankful in the middle of the storm, I never leave his presence. 
And his presence never leaves me next time. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2. Why? Because we're looking at the Jesus. This is Christian's favorite verse. The author and finisher, finisher of our faith. The author and finisher. Chris was finishing sheetrock. He said, you know, I didn't know that Jesus was a finisher. <laughs> he is. You know why? Because he doesn't just nail it up there. Right? right? It doesn't look so, as hot when it's just nailed up there. But when he puts his hand to it, come on, big daddy. All those bumps and holes and all those ripples go away, don't they? It suddenly becomes a beautiful masterpiece. He starts it. If he started it, he's going to finish it. Right? Yeah. You ain't in a storm, just hook her down, baby. Set, just let, do, let go, let God do whatever you got to do. But there's going to come a day when the sun's going to peek through those clouds and you're going to get a new assignment. And because of that storm, you're going to be put in authority. You're going to be promoted. You're going to be sent on a new mission. Awesome. You're going to finally get the edge on the devil that you couldn't quite get. Next page. Oh, Philippians 1 6 says, Be confident. Of this very thing that he has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means before he comes back. That's what I take that as. Take, is, but he's saying whatever he started, he's going to complete. You don't be, you don't be at the end of this thing and not have finished your course. You're not going to be at the end of this thing and be disappointed or frustrated. He said, if I told you to do it, if I promise it to you, if I promise that it on you, I'm going to make it happen. Because I You gotta put hopping down in the rope boat every other day. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cut that sucker loose. <laughs> cut it loose. Right. You don't need it. I've got a ship. I've got a promise that if I stay on this ship, I'm gonna make it to the end. There's no need for any other ship. There's no need for any other boat. Next page. Galatians 6 9 is my last one. It says, let us not grow weary. Well, I'm gonna tell you, that's bad as Best way is I can explain it. Yeah. You've ever been in a fight for your life? Yeah. Taylor's in the hospital. I know, I know I refer to that often, but it doesn't bring me joy all the time. I think back on it and I have a shudder. Because it was horrible. Right. There wasn't a good report. There wasn't uh, somebody that had a now answer. It was all bad, 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 bad. And there were times when I said, and I was shaking my fist at God, and I was mad at him, and I was yelling at him, and I almost got thrown out of the hospital for it. Wow. But I backed the guard back down. I think it was the Holy Ghost. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guess what I was doing in the, in the chapel? I said, I'm praying. What are you doing in the chapel? Right. Oh, Jason, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there was those days. You don't think you'll ever make it through, and that's when you throw the tackle on the board. Yeah. Light your ship. Come on. Yeah. You'll find out those things you thought you just had to do and have when it all boils down. Right. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on to the one thing that does. Right. Because he's the one that gave his life for you. He yeah. purchased your life to give you the abundant life. Yeah. 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 Don't grow weary. Why do you say that? Because it's easy to grow weary. Especially if you're caught in those distractions. Yes. Even if this even if it's the distraction to do good. Right. Yeah. Right? Because what the devil will show you is everything that's wrong. Yeah. yeah. And get you focused on everybody's problem and all the things that are wrong in the world. And you know what we're gonna do. Yeah. yeah. And God says, hey, I'm not gonna. I'm not sending you to them. I'm sending you to that one. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the day of tomorrow we'll go here. And, and you stay on your course. You stay in the place you're supposed to be. Yes. Why we do that? Because in due season, everybody said due season. Due season. We shall reap if we do not quit. Because when you quit, the devil wins. Because that was that was his whole intent and purpose is to get you to quit, get you discouraged, get you distracted, get you discouraged, get you to quit. 
That's what he does all the time. That's why, you know, I, I see all this young love on Facebook. And, you know, we've been together 13 minutes. It's so great. <laughs> oh, snap. I'm like, really? Wow, well, man. Golly, what, what is the anniversary gift for 13 minutes? A toothpick? <laughs> Sometimes we're inviting things to distract us. Yeah. We're inviting heartache. We're, we're making way too much of things that are so temporary. Yeah. Right. Right. But if you set your mind on things above and not on things below, yeah. right? Yeah. right? You're always in his presence. You're always right. thinking like he yeah. is. Let's bow our hands.